So I was one of those kids with an unusually active imagination. Anybody else out there? And I could take any boring situation and make it exciting. I was one of those kids, rocks, sticks, no matter what. I remember I was telling my kids the other day, uh, I had such an active imagination at this school I was at when I was six, I literally drew this entire war scene on my desk. I paid for it later with Mrs. Arnold. But that's just kind of where my, my mind would go. But with that came a lot of physical dreams. And I didn't have a really appropriate language for it, but I would dream things before they would happen. And the only term I had was deja vu. Well, I was 17, I was invited to the Rock of Roseville under the youth pastor tutelage of Mr. Mark Tox, right there in the front row. And when we were there, I was invited on the student leadership team. And they said, we're going to go up to Newcastle and just have a day learning how to hear God's voice. Well, I'd never been a part of anything like that before. So we're there and they teach on hearing God's voice. It says, now it's your turn. You're going to go hear God's voice. And I said, well, what do we do? He said, you grab your journal and you write down what he says. I'm like, well, what is he going to say? He says, I don't know. Go figure it out. So I go out. I find, again, when you're on a retreat, you got to find the like, prettiest place because God only speaks in the really nice places, right? So I get this rock with the sun crest on it, and I'm there, and I'm just sitting, and you're trying to will God's voice. You ever do that before? Like, God speak, God speak, God speak. Nothing, right? I've never done this. God speak, God speak. Well, I, I, it feels like a half an hour goes by. I'm not sure how long it was. And all I get is the word Nicaragua. And I don't know if Nicaragua is a city or a country or what it is. All I've done is report on Brazil. That's all I know about South America and Latin America. So I write down Nicaragua, and I go back to the group. And everybody shares these amazing things, right? How much God loves me, and I'm called to, to change the world. That time, Delirious History Maker was out, right? So I'm called to be a history maker, you know, all this stuff. They go to me. What would you get, Brandon? Uh, Nicaragua. Is that it? Yeah, that's all I got. Lord, we pray for Brandon right now, right? No, that's where it was. <laughs> Next person. So I walk away. I'm like, man, I missed it. Two weeks later, I don't know if you remember this. Two weeks later, Mark gets up, does an announcement, says, hey, we're here to announce our first youth group missions trip, and we're going to Nicaragua. I was like, that's what I heard. That's what I heard. Well, I start having these strange dreams, really weird dreams about these people speaking another language and in, in unusual settings. And I have one specific dream with Mark's son, Micah. And in this dream, we're in like this tent, and Mike is dancing like a monkey, passing out cookies to orphans. So it was a Saturday night, and Sunday morning, Mike is leading worship, and I share the dream with Micah. We laugh about it, no big deal. We now go on the trip to Nicaragua, and I am recognizing every place we go. And all I have is the language deja vu. I'm like, I've been here before. This is a deja vu. And people are like, what? What's and I would know what was going to happen. And I'm getting freaked out. Well, we had the worship team go ahead of us, and there was a city we were visiting that was wiped out by this mudslide. Well, as we go there, there's this tent. As I walk in the tent, there's Micah dancing like a monkey, passing out cookies to orphans. And I run out of the tent, scared to death. <laughs> I go to my team leader, Tom Nolan. I said, Tom, I, I'm, I'm having these dreams, and I don't know what's happened. I don't know what these deja vus. He says, that's called a prophetic dream. And what happened, and then he showed me all these scriptures and all these verses where God would speak in advance and sometimes give these symbolic interpretations that would warn people, and I had no idea. Well, that began a season of unusual encounter. Have you ever had those seasons before? Where it was about a two and a half year period where I had dreams what seemed like nightly. I would write them down, things would happen. I started to see people get healed for the first time, didn't know that was a thing. And I thought, man, revival is here. And in your mind, you create this image, again, active imagination. I can't wait for the crusades I'm going to lead throughout America and Africa and all these places, right? Well, the summer of 2003, I would begin to go to pray for people in the grocery stores, the, the mall. And when I would feel led to pray, I would pray, and then we get healed. When 2003, it stops. I would go pray for people. Nothing would happen. I remember the moment when I was, I was running one day by the American River College. This old man's there with a cane. I said, excuse me, sir, why do you have that cane? He said, because I'm old. And he raised his cane at me, right? And I thought, man, what a horrible thing, right? So I, I, I get frustrated with the Lord. And I would pray for people. I would get insulted. I would get rejected. Nothing would happen. And so I was so mad, I started to make this agreement in my heart that I wouldn't do it anymore. And it was New Year's Eve, 2003. I'm literally driving back from the butler's house, the same place I heard that word four years prior, right? I'm driving back, and I'm yelling at the Lord. 
Now it's New Year's Eve, turn it over to 2004. I said, Jesus, you said if I asked for bread, you would not give a stone. You said if I asked for fish, you would not give a snake. Why then do you ask me to pray for the sick and nothing happens? I'm mad. Holding on my steering wheel, my Ford Escort, you know, like I got this. Well, I have this vision. And there's those visions that change your life. And again, it's not like I'm taken there, but it's in my inner mind, right? And this vision, I'm standing on this seashore, and this giant tidal wave comes, and it crushes me. The vision then rewinds. I'm standing on this large rock. The same tidal wave comes, but the rock breaks the crest of the wave, and I'm unharmed. The Holy Spirit says this, the power you're contending for will kill you unless you're grounded in my character. The power you're contending for will kill you unless you're grounded in my character. And I just shut up for that moment. <laughs> See, I knew that God's revelation wasn't for the increase of my reputation. God's revelation wasn't for results. What I've learned is this. Revelation leads to your refinement. Revelation is more about your refinement and looking like Jesus rather than thinking your name on a marquee at some big conference. Rather than getting a thousand likes on Instagram or having your video go viral on social media. See, Bob Jones, the prophet out of Kansas City, would say this. The greater the revelation, the greater the season of testing that follows. And see, what we understand is God gives us revelation. It's this invitation into his presence that he then refines in us to look like him. See, we want revelation and revival, but the goal is not revival. The goal is that revival happens in us. And he begins to refine us. And what we find throughout the, throughout the Bible is that these divine encounters, these amazing visitations that people have, and then what follows? The worst season of testing that none of us would sign up for. And one of the clearest examples of this is in Genesis 37. And our time's short, so I'll probably just share briefly about this before my final story. In Genesis 37, we have the story of Jacob, who's now renamed Israel, and his son Joseph. Do me a favor, turn with your Bibles. Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. It says this. It says, Now Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other children. Because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now, this word love is unique. Now, I want to just invite you into this process. We know that the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, but there is a translation called the Septuagint, which is Hebrew to Greek. And so what I tend to do is I'll study the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now, we know in Greek there's many words used for love. We have phileo, with friendship, and all these types, different types of love, brotherly love. Well, the term used here in this translation is agape. And what the author is communicating is this, is that there's a preferential love that Jacob has more than any of the other sons towards Joseph. This is a dysfunctional family. What this does is it invites us in that Jacob's now fallen into the generational curse that was modeled in him by his parents with favoritism over the children. And he chooses this son, Joseph, and says, I love him. I have agape love for him more than all my other sons. I choose this son because he's the son of my old age. He's the one that I cherish. And he gives him this long coat. Some of your Bible translations might say a coat of many colors. It's probably not that. But it's this long robe that would declare his status. It's not Jacob in his Technicolor dream coat. He's not spinning and doing circles and dancing, you know, listening to Abba in the background, the dancing queen. That's not what he's doing. But we have this jacket that then declares his status compared to his brother's. It says that his brothers hated him. And what we know is that this family had issues that goes beyond this. Now, why was this jacket significant? It meant that Joseph was now the son of promise, that he's the one that would receive the double inheritance compared to all the brothers. So literally half of his father's estate would go to him, and the rest is going to be distributed to the brothers. Here's the problem. That was promised to Reuben, but Reuben forfeited it when he slept with one of his father's concubines. This family had issues. Genesis 35. 
One scholar writes this, the long robe suggests that Joseph becomes the chosen son of promise. The other 11 are Esau. Did you capture that? Joseph becomes the son of promise. The other 11 become Esau. Why is this significant? We have this battle of favoritism with Jacob and Esau, these two brothers. And here's Jacob. He carries out this generational curse of favoritism. Here's the thing. We think that we can break generational curses and patterns through willpower. Here's the reality. Only the blood of Jesus can break a generational curse. And what we do is we make these bitter root judgments in our heart and say, I'll never be like, or I'll never do. And what happens is that sin multiplies. And so now instead of one son feeling disapproved, we have 11 sons that feel left out. And now they hate Joseph. This is a really hostile rage that is building up. But Joseph doesn't get the hint. Joseph really loves his status. He really loves his position. So what happens? Genesis 37, verse 5. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field, and suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams. The word he uses here for bow down means worship. And here's the problem. Joseph doesn't correct them. When Joseph shares this revelation, he shares it knowing exactly what he means. And he's expecting his brothers to serve him. And he has an image and idea of what that's going to look like. But his brothers, they hate him. There's this hostile rage that's brewing. And Joseph doesn't end there. He continues. Verse 9. And he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers saying, look, I've had another dream. The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. They were worshiping me. But when he told it to his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him. Now this word rebuke is harsh disapproval. It's the highest word that Jacob can use to reprimand his son. And he said this, and he said, what kind of dream is this that you have had? Shall we indeed, I and your mother and your brothers bow down to the ground before you? Verse 11. So his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in his heart. See, really, jealousy is, is, is a word that's not adequate in the English language to describe this. I love the Swedish translation. The Swedish translation for jealousy is black bile. Talk about a descriptor. We see this progression of hate start in verse 2 all the way to this capstone of jealousy. And there is this deep brew of bitterness in the hearts of these brothers. And what we notice is this. When you have generational curses, these bitter root judgments take place, and it creates this toxic system. And what happens is many of us, when we have rejection or betrayal or brokenness, the enemy comes in and sows seeds of bitterness, so that thing eventually takes over your entire life. That's what happens. I remember once I was running over by the uh, disc golf course in Rockland. You ever been there before? As I'm running there, there's all these thistled tumbleweeds, and I see this man pulling these thistled weeds. I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm pulling these thistled tumbleweeds because my son's bowls would get lost in these all the time. I said, oh, where's your son? He's like, oh, my son's old now. He doesn't talk to me anymore. I'm like, I wonder why he doesn't talk to you anymore, right? Well, I said, well, do you need some help? He's like, grab a bag. I said, okay. So I grab a bag, start pulling these weeds, pulling them up, putting them in. And I'm noticing this is an entire field of these thistled weeds. I said, doesn't the city like remove these a couple times a year? He says, they don't do a good enough job. So I, I try to like build small talk. I realize he's not in the mood for small talk. I fill up a trash bag. I said, here you go. He said, just set it there. So I went back home. I said, what, what's the fruit of this labor? So I went home and I explored thistle tumbleweeds. And I found out they're called a taproot. And here's that picture. We just had it up a second ago. Look at the bottom here. Here's what's unique. The taproot system is all underground. And here's what happens is you've removed the surface weed. It doesn't do anything to the underground system. And for a lot of us, we deal with the symptoms of bitterness and brokenness, but we'd never deal with the root. 
and we look at the symptoms and the effects of our life, these bitter root judgments and the depression, and the anxiety, all this stuff. And so many times, again, we'll pray for that stuff as long as we need to here at this church, but really it's an underlining root system that's toxic. It's become septic that God needs to heal and restore. So this family has jealousy and it's bad. So Jacob then sends his son to go look after the brothers yet again. It just really communicates the distance and disconnection that Jacob has with his entire family. So the brothers go to the grazing land. They take all the sheep. Jacob stays, or Joseph stays back, which again implies that he has no real responsibility in the household. Well, his, his, his father sends him on this journey. He literally walks 70 to 80 miles to go find his brothers. It's the equivalent of walking Sacramento to San Francisco. He's in this nice jacket, which communicates he has money and he has no servants, probably no camel, unprotected. Joseph is naive. He's really in harm's way. His father puts him in danger is what happens. As he goes there, the brothers see him from a distance and they conspire to kill him. This is a skilled work of evil. As he walks closer to him, they take him, they grab him, they strip his robe from him, they strip his status from him, what he was known for, they remove. They throw him in this pit, and it says that it's this waterless pit that they throw him in. The word here in Hebrew is sakel, which means a grave. This is a dark place. He is intended to die. Most likely, this is where they would throw dead carcasses if they were in the grazing land. This is a dark place. This is a place you do not want to be in. And as he's there, he overhears his brothers conspiring against him as they're eating lunch over his near-dead corpse. This is a dark scene. And as he's there, I'm fully confident of this. Instead of letting this generational curse of bitterness seep in, he invites the presence of Yahweh to meet him. And as he's in this place, as he's in this pit, think about this. He's there and the author says it was a waterless pit. What is Joseph known for? He's known for saving a nation in the midst of drought. He's in the waterless pit. He has the dream that precedes this, but he's going to save others from the same waterless pit that he's now in. Here's what we have to understand. Your present pain is preparation for future purpose. Your present pain is preparation for a future purpose. You just don't know what it is yet. And he hears them conspiring, but Reuben knows that he's going to save his brother. So he goes out, but then they say, hey, Judah says this. Why are we going to kill him? Let's make some money off of this. The very tribe that Messiah comes from is the one that's trying to get money for his brother's body. So they take his robe, they dip it in goat's blood, and they sell him for 20 shekels of silver. Why is this important? Here's a picture of a shekel. Do we have that picture? This is probably a more modern shekel than at that time. A shekel of silver could be used to buy land, it could be used to buy goats, but the price is significant. According to Fordham University, they sell him for the price of an unwanted female slave. Now, I understand in our culture, we know men and women are equal. That's a biblical value. That time, not the case. They sell him for the lowest price. And you can imagine how much he would be mocked and disregarded because of that. Joseph, the female slave. At that time, it was not a title you wanted. But here's how we know Joseph invited the Holy Spirit into his brokenness. Genesis 39, verse 2, says this. Now Joseph was taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain guard, an Egyptian bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down here. Verse 2, but the Lord was with Joseph. And he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. Now here's Joseph, whose robe is ripped from him. His status symbol is ripped. He's sold as a female slave. But as he's now in the house of the Egyptian master, since the Lord was with him and he was successful. What's successful about Joseph? He has no status. He has no wealth. He's a nobody and his family thinks he's dead. Here's the deal. The biblical definition of success is not our cultural definition of success. 
And the word success here is this, it's salak. It means to break out, to move forward, and to prosper. And because the Lord was with him, he prospered. In the middle of his brokenness, God brought him breakthrough. In the middle of his pain, God used him as a messenger of hope to those he would never be able to reach. And this is my challenge to you, church. If you're in that pit, if you're in that dark place and there is no water, don't allow the enemy to come and sow seeds of bitterness and have those generational curses form. That's not what we want. But the Holy Spirit wants you to invite him into that place and to embrace the breaking. You to embrace the breaking of the Holy Spirit in that moment. Because through that, we're seeing this revelation result in his refinement that will eventually lead to the salvation of an entire nation. This is a significant story. I remember in 2008, at that time, I was set on just seeing what the Holy Spirit wanted to do. I'd pray for people and just do my thing. Well, I had lots of leaders that I had met and built relationship with. And at that time, there was an outpouring of God's Spirit in Lakeland, Florida. And so I had many friends go out there. And the person at the time, who I'll rename, uh, keep him nameless here, was leading this giant revival but he was teaching really false doctrine. And I would watch these live streams and I could not believe what they were communicating from the stage. It went on for several weeks. Well, all the leaders I looked up to went and prayed for this gentleman on stage and endorsed the work that he was doing. I remember that specific moment and I saw that. I said, wait, wait, is no one listening to what's being communicated? The arrogance in which this is being led and the really false doctrine that's being communicated and not one of those leaders corrected him. And I was so mad that I made a bitter root judgment in my heart. And I saw that happen. I remember saying this as I saw it. It was in my inner mind. I said, Holy Spirit, I want you to lead, but you're going to lead on my terms. Think about this. This is how the enemy works. He, he uses something that was an appropriate you know, offense that I had, but then he comes in with a lie that now becomes a block to what God wants to do. Those two years were incredibly difficult. Here at a church, it's the midst of the financial collapse. And in 2010, I receive a phone call. We're about to do this winter camp in Chico, California. And I get a call from the youth pastor of Bethel. And he calls me, he says, hey, we heard that you're doing a camp over at Chico. We used to do them with you guys way back in the day. He said, uh, can we join you? And the first thing that comes to mind is, I'm going to let you lead this. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. I said, uh, yeah, you can join us as long as I get to pick the speakers and the worship team. Because I knew if I had control, it wouldn't get crazy. He said, sure. So they come on out. I picked this speaker from the International House of Prayer because I knew he would teach the Bible but at the same time, would still be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So we picked the worship team. The first night comes. My friend's name's Dave Slyker. He gets up there. Well, Dave, who is known for teaching the word, grabs the microphone and begins to laugh hysterically. I'm not happy with this. Now, I've been exposed to these things, but this is not on the agenda, and this is not what we've scheduled. And in my mind, I've brought this group of Presbyterian kids that I've been working with in the high schools. And they told me, we'll come as long as you guys don't do that weird stuff. And the first thing that happens is this. And I get up to correct him. And I fall to the ground in the power of the Holy Spirit. All the Bethel kids are laughing, right? All my kids are like, what's happening? And here I am weeping on the ground. And I get this vision of the Lord's throne and at the base of the throne is this burning heart and I remember saying Lord what about the kids and he said let me govern their hearts this goes on for an hour it's absolute chaos there's no word preached I'm so mad I'm so offended I pulled Dave aside I said what was that he said listen we're in the middle of an outpouring of God's spirit in Kansas City I will not apologize for what the Lord is doing I said hey listen Dave I respect you just give context tomorrow. Next morning, he teaches a little bit. The same thing happens. Well, now I'm feeling this. And you know when the Holy Spirit comes and you resist it? Well, that was me all day. So I pull my friend aside. I said, we got to get out of here. 
So let's go to Trader Joe's. We go to the Trader Joe's in Chico. As we're there, we're just grabbing food, and I love cheese. Any cheese fans out there? I love cheese. Trader Joe's cheese section is incredible. Way cheaper than Whole Foods. So I go over there, and there's this cheese I hadn't seen before. It's called frying cheese. So I go to grab the cheese, and the Holy Spirit comes on me. And literally, this is what I think. Lord, are you in the frying cheese? Like, that's literally what I thought. Well, I look around, and there's Dave. He just walked into Trader Joe's. I pull my other friend and say, we got to get out of here. I'm not going to be around David. And he's, I mean, he's manifesting. He's doing the whole thing. And if you met Dave, he's spoken here a couple times. This is not his personality. So next door to Trader Joe's is Starbucks. So I go to Starbucks. I'm trying to get my composure. I order, I order this drink. In walks Dave. And he's laughing. I give him this look. And I go there to order. And he goes up to me and he pokes my back. And electricity shoots through my body and go, whoa! I said, what are you doing? I said, stop it. And he goes up to me and he goes, Zzz. I go, ah, stop it. I poured my drink. I go over the table where the Starbucks counter, and literally I'm on the Starbucks counter where they drop the drinks off. I'm just like this. Comes up to me and says this. He said, listen, the Lord sent me here for you. I said, well, what, what, are, you, what are you trying to do? He said, you made a vow in your heart that you would not let the Holy Spirit lead without your control. I've come here to make you repent of that vow you made. I burst into tears. I fall on the ground. Dave bursts into laughter with his hand on my back in the middle of Starbucks. No one knows what to do. And so here's this man weeping, this man laughing hysterically, and they're like, white mocha? And this guy comes and literally steps over my back, grabs his drink, and runs out of the Chico Starbucks. Only the Lord can do these things. He said, I was sent here to remove those bitter roots. That produced a season of awakening where we said, and that's why you come here on a Sunday, we don't care what the schedule says. I don't care how many hours I spent on this message that we did not preach. What does the Holy Spirit want to do? And I feel for us, it's a season of awakening. Invite the Holy Spirit into this season. Get dreams, great. Don't get weird. Don't get weird about it. But let the Holy Spirit come in you, restore you, heal you, bring restoration.